Hello and happy, happy new year. Hey, thanks everybody for joining today. My name is Michael Morales. I am, of course, the Director of Business and Consulting Services here at Hawaiian Telecom. And I'd like to welcome you to our first Hawaiian Telecom University live event of the year. Really excited. A lot of great surprises for this year. A lot of great fun. Um, but also transformative this year or these past couple of years for us at HT. So, you know, obviously we've been building um, our fiber optics infrastructure for um, the state. Um, and, and, and also we're a trusted network and service provider on the telephone side. But what I want to talk about a little bit, and we're going to get into security a lot today, um, talk about some of the advanced services that we're doing. Of course, you know, I'll just mention a few things like cloud service. Uh, managed IT service, cybersecurity, data network services, data assessments. Um, I'll say this, guys. If you want to ask me if there's something that you don't think we do, put it into the, the, the stream of the questions later on in, in LinkedIn and let us know. And I bet you we do most or all of them. Um, what we don't do is we don't flip burgers. We don't make sushi. But <laughs> we could do that, too, if you needed us to. So lots of transformation over these couple of years. I'm really excited about it. So... Today, I'm going to address the elephant in the room because I know a lot of you are here saying, that doesn't look like Jordan Silva or Evan Horton. Well, folks, it's not. Um, unfortunately, those gentlemen couldn't make it today. Um, <clears throat> but say hello to my little security friend, Mike Taraco. Hey, Mike. Hey, how's it going? Good morning, everybody. Glad to be here. Even if I'm second string, it's still great to be here. <laughs> exactly. Mike, hey, tell the people a little about yourself. Yeah, I'm a principal consultant over here at uh, Hawaiian Telecom for probably almost about four years now. So worked in a lot of different industries locally in the in the Honolulu area. Um, so yeah, just uh, you know focusing mostly on security the last ten years or so, and then happy to come over to uh, Hawaiian Telecom help out the advanced services team. Yeah, thanks so much, Mike. And Mike's great. Um, uh, we work together a bunch, and uh, I'm really excited to have him on on the, on the show today. Um, so, you know, we're talking about uh, 2023 uh, cybersecurity resolutions. And and before we get into cybersecurity, I'm going to say there's a couple of resolutions, or at least one that both Mike and I share uh, that we definitely aren't going to do this year um, that we did last year. Is and we uh, have a resolution not to break any bones this year. Yeah, Mike. Well, I, I don't know if we could say we're not going to break any bones, but we're going to try our best not to break any bones. That's exactly. <laughs> and, and, and the thing is, folks, uh, yeah, we both broke some bones. Um, yeah, I, I broke the clavicle. He broke some ribs. That'll be a different podcast. That's uh, Mike Taraco and and beers and, and broken bones. But that is a separate <laughs> show. So um, let's get into security right now. And the first thing we want to talk about is, uh, you know, our first resolutions. Uh, so what are security groups thinking about? specifically with defense in depth? Well, along the lines of defense in depth, um, you know, a lot of companies have, uh, you know, products, organization have products in place to kind of address certain, uh, you know, compliance or regulatory needs. So I think at this point, at the beginning of the year, it's probably a good time to kind of look back at what you have in place. You know, maybe some of it has been set up, you know, years past um, and things are working well or they're not working well. And if you don't look at the tools that you're using, those might be things that you need to adjust, or actually uh, you may have some overlap that you could save some money um, and use that for, for other security purposes or other business purposes. So those are some of the things uh, to think about. Yeah, it, it definitely makes a lot of sense. Obviously there's a budget season right now. People are going through kind of what they have, what they need to do, you know, and, and let's be, be honest, you know, with, with what, it is in the economy right now and in potential recessions. It's good to look at these things and look at consolidating. And obviously there's things that HD helps with. We don't really go into that much, but you know, that's where we can help also kind of look to sh shift and consolidate different resources or, or applications and systems. 
Yeah, it's kind of like along the lines, you know, everybody has a spring cleaning. So, you know, you try to focus on that, uh, make sure you're aware of your inventory, um, you know, make sure it's up to date and tidy, you know, tidy being an operable, I don't know, whatever <laughs> word that you, you could say, um, you know, and then make sure that if there is overlap for some of your systems, you can actually, um, you know, you remove that overlap or it might be something critical systems, you might want to actually have that overlap. So if one system fails, yeah you have coverage for the other. And that's kind of along the lines of defense in depth. Yeah, and I know we'll get into backups and everything else later. Um, talk a little about some of the other things that you're, you know, that folks are pretty, pretty much top of mind right now. Yeah, so I would say, uh, you know, some of the requests that we get and to help help out with are, um, you know, kind of doing the, the general assessments of uh, people's environments, right? So they have their internal teams or they had consultants or IT kind of helping out and, you know, putting things into their environment. But I think getting that uh, stepping back a little bit and having a general view of what you're doing for security is a good mm -hmm. idea. Along the lines of that, um, a lot of our customers are looking into EDR, um, mm -hmm. especially with uh, workers being remote. Um, there are many, you know, other problems that come up for security because all of your equipment is no longer inside your network, right? It's yeah. kind of outside. Um, and then there are threats that may come in from that vector and then you want to be able to to stop it detect it number one and stop it at the endpoint before it right. gets to your back to your environment and how quickly does that occur i mean when you talk about endpoint detection and response i mean you know you see kind of whether it's a hack or something or some kind of corrupted file or how does how quickly does that you know use that response time go uh, most of the time, it's it. From what I've seen, it's been you know within seconds uh, of okay. something getting out to that endpoint. But if it's something that's kind of like uh, you know there, there's not a you know there's certain movements that happen on an endpoint that kind of yeah. show up like it's something bad. Um, some some of the times it will hesitate a little bit to make sure it's not actually a legitimate function, and mm -hmm. then um, it it'll actually create um, uh, cr create a, a block for that, um, and that sometimes takes you know a minute or two in order okay. to catch that, right? So it's continuously being updated. So it's it's pretty good at what it does and stops yeah. a lot of things that your traditional uh, security tools don't. And so, so for, uh, and, and some from an EDR perspective, that that's one aspect from from an AV and right and an antivirus perspective. Uh, yeah, um, yeah. AV antivirus is is basically you know kind of an older method uh, to catch these things. Um, a lot of the AVs now are actually transitioning over to EDR. So if you do have EDR, you don't have to worry so much about uh, antivirus. But I mean, mm -hmm. it's it's a, it's also a great thing to have in your portfolio of uh, of tools, so mm -hmm. that some things get caught in EDR. Um, a lot of things get caught in EDR, and then some things uh, still uh, AV or antivirus is a good place to you know to have that installed on every device as well. Okay. And obviously then ta ta taking a little bit further with network intrusion detection and that kind of stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. So there's, you know, ta we, we talked up to this point about the endpoints, uh, yep. servers and, and workstations and, you know, remote workers and things like that. Um, and then, you know, of course, your kind of traditional uh, intrusion detection, IDS, IPS um, systems are there to prevent, you know, from movement across the network for things that actually make it in anyway. Oh, excellent. Excellent. Yeah. And, 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 and obviously, you know, there's, there's, there's app logs too, and, and Sims and, and, and management of that. So uh, how, how do you best prepare or kind of prioritize on those things too? Yeah. So uh, I would say, you know, if the organization's uh, big enough, um, it's something that you should probably look into uh, a SIM tool, which is uh, mm -hmm. security information and event management. So basically you're feeding logs from AV, from your EDR, from uh, critical applications, critical servers into this SIM that's actually uh, not uh, closely related with those servers, usually outside of the environment. Nowadays, a lot of uh, a lot of SIM providers, it's, it's in the cloud as well. So it's really hard to get to to manipulate. So one of the you know, one of the things that attackers do or is they get into a system, do what they have to do, exfiltrate data, and then they go back and try and clean up the logs. So this would be a way that even if they do that, you have a set of logs that are kind of off off to the side where you can actually, especially for incident response, there are things that mm -hmm. if you don't have logs, you're gonna have a really hard time. Insurance is not gonna pay out on it, right? So those are things that you wanna make sure you're doing the right thing 
uh, especially nowadays as insurance premiums are going up skyrocket. Yeah. Especially to retain that information. And, and, and in case of what reminds me of really is um, a movie called Enemy of the State. Enemy of the State. It was um, a film okay. back in 1998. Um, I, you've probably seen it, right? Is that Will Smith? Is that the one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's okay. Will Smith. Okay. There's Gene Hackman. This cast, and, and folks, if you get a chance, look at this cast. They've got a crazy amount of people in this one. Jack Black. Seth Rogen, Barry Pepper, <laughs> Jake Busey, Gary Busey's kid. That's kind of interesting too. So, but the thing is, there's a scene, right? And 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 obviously Will Smith is the main character, and Gene Hackman is kind of a supporting role. I don't think he got uh, a nominee for anything on this one, but um, there, the, it's it's about Will Smith, and he has this information, and and the NSA is going after him, and Will Smith makes a phone call, and they're at. Gene Hackman's warehouse or his home, but it's a warehouse. And because Will Smith made a call, they were able to track him. And then Gene Hackman had to blow up the whole place and they get out of there in a car. <laughs> and he's like, what happened? He's like, you made a phone call. So that's why he had to blow up the place. But did he have a SIM? I don't know. I don't think so. I, I would I would say back at that time, they, you know, some companies, the, the big companies did have it. Nowadays it's it's more readily available and it's it's kind of inexpensive versus you know, not being able to do business anymore or figure out what's going on. So, yeah, I would say, uh, yeah, that's that's one way that you could actually figure out what went on despite. So mm -hmm. they would still you would still be able to tr track them from their calls yeah. and things like that. If you feed all that data into your SIM and your your log uh, retention area. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Hey, how about um, some of the other couple of things like domain controllers or NTP? Yeah, so domain controllers are definitely uh, things in your environment. Uh, every login and, and log out to you know your enterprise windows and servers should be logged into your SIM as well or your, your log management tool. Um, another thing to keep in mind when you're setting these things up is uh, NTP. So network mm -hmm. time protocol is definitely key because if you're doing correlation across the logs that, that get fed into there, if your time is not accurate, um, then you will have more difficulty figuring out what's going on and and a lot of older servers tend to have like their batteries kind of wear out a little bit and they call it um uh clock drift or, or yeah. yeah so okay. so the drift actually causes trouble you'll get alerts and you, you, many times you won't know about it unless you look into the logs of that server and if you have yeah. it in the sim you could find that stuff pretty easily yeah. Clock drift. Yeah, I guess I'm kind of familiar with that. I'm also familiar with the Tokyo drift. There's a lot of different <laughs> types of drifts out there, um, yeah, so, which are pretty so, cool. So drift, drift is kind of interesting because, like when when I mentioned earlier about you know attackers going in and yeah. cleaning up logs, so mm -hmm. they'll actually shift the time, so that really? they can yeah, so they can hide what they're doing and clean up, and then and then it'll just kind of look like it overwrote whatever was in there. So they they kind of cover their tracks, right? Oh, okay. Yeah. So it's different so, from when kids are at school and they try to like back in the days, like most people don't know, like the younger people don't know, they they, they have the clocks on the wall and, and you could like move the 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 the, yeah. the, uh, the hand so you could be I, like in and out of school earlier. No, they did it in, I think that was a scene in the office, right? Where they, uh, they oh, set is that what, the, the time to. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. And they have Michael Scott and, and it was like two o'clock or something. He was asleep and they woke and they woke him up yeah. and he was like, yeah, it's time to go. It's time to go, man. Let's go. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So same thing. You can, you can do whatever you want during those three hours of uh, fun time, right? Nice referencing. Cool. Hey, man. So I, obviously that's part of the defense in depth. Let's kind of move over to kind of um, um, up update softwares, uh, software and patching system. The first patching I want to talk about is, you know, the patching I have that um, I have a, a, a patch in, in my clavicle now. It's, it's actually a metal plate. Um, so it makes <laughs> it stronger. Patch. So I'm assuming that patching always makes you stronger, um, gives you bionics. Uh, yeah, I would say most patching, you know, back in the old days, Windows patching sometimes mm -hmm. did bad things for your environment. But nowadays, I think they test pretty good. Um, and also when you're implementing stuff, you should you should thoroughly test it as well. Um, but then uh, if you're looking at that bang for your buck, like cost for uh, controls, I would say actually doing regular patching and configuration management. Those are some of the easiest ways to kind of make your environment a lot more resilient. Um, mm -hmm. And people say like, oh, I got to like bring down some servers in order to, you know, patch them. So it's taking some downtime. And it's like, well, the, the, the argument is, do you want planned downtime or do you want unplanned downtime? Those are the things that you want to kind of think about. And if your business is critical, you would I would say that patching, testing and patching and configuration management is a way to go. 
Um, one of the ways that we do it, we're actually implementing for a couple of organizations now, building out the plan. So we're trying to get them to a monthly cadence where you go through all the patches, third parties, you were talking about multi, uh, I think there's multi, um, you know, other third party vendors like Java or, or whatever it might be. Um, so, so those things are, uh, you would want to have included in there too for all vendors, especially like critical applications as well. So it's not just Windows patching. It's, mm -hmm. you know, network equipment, um, all of your infrastructure, your firewalls and that. So those there's vendors like us that can do, you know, the network equipment and make sure that's up to date and, you know, schedule the times for that. And then mm -hmm. um, having that program, if you want to show metrics to your, uh, to your management, you could say, hey, look, we're doing really well each month to month where our patch levels are going down, which is actually a good thing for patching, you know, showing that your, your servers and workstations are patched. And then that way you can uh, free up some, some resources in order to get uh, other controls that might help the environment too. Like for, you know, for example, EDR and things like that, that kind of help along the um, defense in depth method. That makes sense. So um, what about, you know, obviously I've, I've had some customers ask me about um, at a certain level, they're looking at like NIST patch management, the National Institute of Standards and Technology. So, you know, is that something for everybody or is that something for really relegated to larger customers? W what's the thought there? Yeah, NIST is not really, um, it's not really a, a, a methodology per se. It's more of like guidance from the a national organization. So, I mean, they're like, you know, things like PCI, credit card data, uh, you know, I don't think Sarbanes-Oxley really kind of gets into it too much. No. Um, but they're definitely patching your systems and keeping things up to date is mm -hmm. definitely a great thing. Um, I know PCI, if you have end of life equipment in your environment and you're mm -hmm. running uh, card data across it, that's a, a, a thing that you need to kind of address at some point. So there's, you know, in Hawaii, we we all have some end of life equipment and or older things that are yeah. legacy systems, and those are the things that um, until you do your vulnerability scanning, like scanning your devices, um, yeah. you're not going to realize that those things can be a problem. So you're going to be probably set up your your program so that you can um, you know patch what you can, and then there's always going to be some exceptions, and those exceptions yeah. document them, make sure management's aware of it, you sign off on it. And then for the things that you cannot, absolutely cannot patch, there's ways that you can protect that in your environment. So they're less likely to be a target, right? For example, like, you know, 2003 servers, those are yes. some things that if you still have them in your environment, there is no patches for them. And you're going to have to do some uh, some good security in order to keep those things protected in case well, anybody those gets isn't it coming up in October, or November? Is it 2008 going like, like they're going to yeah. go end of life as well? So, Absolutely. I mean, obviously we're getting closer and I think everybody out there, take a look at those servers. And obviously, you know, want you want to make sure you're secure, um, especially with those types of things and having upgrades, doing an action plan for that. Obviously, these are all things that we're really good at. We do that today. But um, yeah, it's, it's something I know that we're working with other customers on. Uh, which is, it, it, you know, obviously very, you set up a project budget for it and you kind of, then you can phase it out over time and you can also make sure that, you know, you're not hit with an, an absorbing cost in, in one year of, of a capital budget perspective, uh, uh, season. So. Yeah. And patching and configuration management is pretty cost effective because a lot of, uh, you know, system administrators are already familiar with the process, mm -hmm. right? So it's not going to cost a, a big amount of money. The only thing is kind of, you know, drawing up those policies and procedures and making sure you stick to them. Those are those are important things that we kind of overlook. Once it gets put in place, we are like, ah, we don't need to do any mm -hmm. vulnerability scans because we, we don't know. We don't have any problems, but yeah. that's not really necessarily the good thing. And if you do have insurance for it, those insurance providers are going to want to see proof that you're actually you know, doing what you say you're doing, even the auditors, if you have auditors come in to look at it. That, that's a great point. I know in, in some of the other, um, whether it, I think it was the live event where we talked about, you know, insurance and auditors and, and understanding mm -hmm. the clients of security and, and always the, the changing landscape of what the requirements are. I, everything, when, when you, it, it is all kind of relatable and connected to everything you do, especially in the security environment, which, which many things are in IT. Yeah, and then just to kind of, you know, just to reiterate too, um, I've talked to many customers that have talked to their insurance providers and now the the rates are so high 
that they're actually thinking to self-insure for certain things. So really? I don't think, yeah, so not every corporation or, or organization can do that. But I mean, at some point you got to say like, okay, maybe it's time to forget about insurance or, or you know, roll it back a little bit and actually try to do some security, you know. Hey, you know what, uh, Mike, just as we're kind of looking at I do see that we see, uh, I see a little um, added uh, stream on uh, LinkedIn's coming through here. So there are, you guys are, I am seeing the, uh, uh, the, the messages. I don't know if you're oh, cool. seeing those too, just to, I, so I hey, everybody, thanks, thanks for, uh, <laughs> thanks for the, uh, thanks for the, the messages in the, in the stream. And oh, yeah, I, I do really see appreciate them. that. Yeah. yeah, some funny stuff. Uh, um, yeah. Yeah, good stuff. Hey, um, all right. So obviously we've talked about a little bit about the patching part of it, the software update part of it. Um, just thoughts on kind of, you know, software from multi-system updates, you know, your thoughts, how that works. You know, obviously people have a lot of disparate systems that aren't under one kind of software up update. Um, it, uh, what, do you, what do you think about that? And, and what's the best security approach for those types of systems and applications? Yeah, I think this is uh, kind of a recurring thing. Everybody or a lot of organizations have, uh, you know, have things tuned in for their Windows environment. So yeah, mm -hmm. third parties um, outside your applications that you use, your cloud applications generally, those get patched themselves. But um, yeah, but there there's other things that you want to have included in there. Okay. Hey, let's move on to a couple more things. I know we we're going to talk a little bit about just um, cybersecurity training. Um, yeah. What's what is some of the ideas for organization? I know we're we, we, we talk about kind of employees staying safe and doing the right thing, of course. Um, but what are the other things we want to just highlight? Today? Yeah. So, you know, we, we've also been working on this for a couple of organizations. Uh, having an AUP or acceptable use policy in place is kind of a baseline of letting employees understand, you know, the limits of, of using your work, uh, work machine or, or whatever it might be. Uh, and then also letting them know that it's uh, being monitored or can be monitored. So those are things you could do. Uh, there's templates out there for, you know, a simple email campaign that you could do from from yourselves. Or there are some uh, some examples out there at Sans Institute or ISACA or ISC Squared uh, for those templates. Um, there are, uh, you know, uh, companies or, or tools that you could use, like some, you know, No Before is one of them. There's a whole bunch of other ones that can actually do the campaign, automate that for you. And it also keeps track. So people use that as like a LMS uh, service where you can keep track mm -hmm. of compliance and make sure that people have clicked through uh, training if, if there are any problems. Um, okay. And then there's also the traditional LMS where you go through annual training. So those right. are things that you could do. Yeah, and, and, and uh, hopefully most people do. Obviously, if you have any questions about it, um, like we always say, you can reach out to us and talk about it via LinkedIn or, or, or through HTU. Um, as far as kind of like just security, cybersecurity training itself, when you talk about like CEH uh, V11 or, or CISSP or CSA, okay. CISM, ABCDF, EM, and Yeah, yeah. And okay, I, I see what you're saying. So <laughs> what we talked about previously was like general user security yeah. training, right? So yes. yeah, so um, amongst, you know, for the IT staff or for the security staff, you actually want to make sure one of the most important things is make sure your security team is, uh, you know, trained up well and up yeah. to date. So yeah, uh, SANS has has a bunch of different, um, you know, cyber certs, ISACA, ISC squared, CISSP is one of the name, namely ones. So those are things yeah. that, yeah, you want to keep your staff uh, trained up. Um, you know, us at HT, for example, our security group, I, everybody has at least one cert, like people like Jordan or myself, we have multiple certs yeah. for these things. And you know, Absolutely. we could talk to, to PCI, card data, or, you know, Sovereign's actually, there's no real cert for it, but a lot of yeah. us have done work with it. So we oh, can do all those things. Interesting. Good stuff. Um, okay. I, I know we're running a little bit short on time. Well, we have one more area we wanted to really address and yeah. just, you know, some keys to developing a strong backup recovery plan. What are some of the keys that you usually like to talk about when you're talking to um, customers? Yeah. I, I think, um, you know, there's a lot of different things that backups and recovery have been uh, set up in a, a long time in the past. So those are things that you want to revisit, like annually say, hey, here's my New Year's resolution. Let me review what I have in place and then see if it's good. If it's good, you could keep it the same. If, if it's not good, then you say like, oh, you know what? We got this new application in the environment. Maybe we'll, we want to uh, kind of tighten things up a little bit. And I, I think the you know, the rule of thumb is the a three, two, one backup strategy in general. 
Um, so it means like having three copies of your data, two local on site of different media, maybe read devices, and then one off site, which now a lot of the off site is cloud based. Um, and some some uh, legacy applications, for example, have like uh, tapes still. I think people are still wow. using tapes. I you know, but those are like. So, yeah, so that's a good point. So uh, I've also heard about you know uh, three two two. So having cloud and off site. What what's your thoughts on that? I I mean I don't know. I've never heard that before. I mean I'm sure it exists, but I think <laughs> uh, you know yeah, it depends on your application and which ones are critical. You might have different schedules. Like some some critical applications have like you know every five minutes it does backups yeah. or something like that. I, I got another one for you. What's it's, the other one? Called it's called a uh, uh, Amber three one one here. Here, I, I have to play it. Everybody, this is, we're adding what is to, that? The, to the show. All right, that's that's three eleven. That's three one one. That's three eleven. Oh man, that's a, that's a blast from the past. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I can only find that as something that that something with three one and a one, but it didn't have three one two. So sorry yeah. about that. Well, you could do three one one. Three one one works as well. <laughs> so, all right, hey, uh, Mike. Any other final thoughts before we close up today? Yeah, I, I think just the the general thing is, uh, you know, just circling back, like looking at what you have in place. Is it sufficient? Have uh, has your environment changed over the past year, or have you moved stuff to cloud? Is your is your cloud footprint expanded? Um, you know, we have some customers that are looking at kind of building hybrid uh, environments. So along with the hybrid environment, there's there's going to be some security challenges there too, right? Because you don't necessarily have all the log data that you want out of uh, cloud environments because it's limited. Of course, you could pay for you know pay for it, but it's going to cost you money. So you know. There's things to look at. Make sure your policies are up to date. We have a lot of organizations that we deal with that are, you know, things have been written for old password policies. Um, you know, nowadays MFA or multi-factor authentication is in there. Make sure that's in your policies. Uh, you know, just in case, you know, somebody asks, you, you need to have that stuff updated. So yeah, update your stuff. Make sure it's good. And if you need help, there's there's organizations out there like us that can help, or there's other vendors that can help as well too, or do it internally. Yeah. Awesome stuff. Hey, Mike, thanks again. Hey, everybody, thanks so much for joining today for our first uh, of the 2023 year uh, Hawaiian Telecom University live discussion. So hopefully you've, you've gotten some information. You can adopt some of these resolutions that we talked about today. Um, obviously, you can tell the, the passion that, that we have, especially Mike, about cybersecurity and um, love to talk to you guys about that. Hey, if you have any questions or thoughts on cybersecurity, on anything we do from an advanced services perspective, and you have questions about it, seriously, we invite you to join our conversation on LinkedIn Group or Hawaiian Telecom University. Um, there should be a, a QR code possibly that shoots up here at some point um, to join, um, but um, there it is. Thank you so much, Chris. Uh, we'll be having more virtual and in-person events, bigger, better, and more fun than last year. Really excited. I'm going to bring more music. Sorry, I got to bring more impressions this year. I'm going to do it. Um, and we're going to have a lot of fun. So, hey, guys, thanks again. Um, stay safe and stay secure. Aloha. Yep. yep. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a great day. Aloha. <laughs>